Okay. okay, welcome to the uh, presentation we've done for the last couple of years on uh, to commemorate the Civil War. This is the four-year period of, of that. This is so. Today's plans are to discuss the activities, some of the activities, major activities of 1864, and uh, we have with us uh, a Civil War soldier who is off the field today for this occasion, and the president is waiting to give his presentation as well. So I welcome you to net today for this. Uh, continued series. Next year will be the final of the four, so I hope you'll make plans to be here in attendance next year. Mr. Civil War Soldier. John Gilbert. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Without you, David, we couldn't get this done here. Yeah, well, ladies and gentlemen, well, I know all you folks. It's good to see you here. We don't have a big crowd, but we're going to try to relay a little few things. I'm going to keep this short, not an hour like I did last year. Try to cover this quickly. I'm just going to hit a few high points here. It's the year 1864. We never thought we could recover from 1863. As you remember, some of the horrible battles. Gettysburg, Port George Meade. He was told by Abraham Lincoln, was sent a letter. Why did you not pursue this? Why you had the chance to wrap this army up here, the Army of the Confederacy, under Robert E. Lee. If I'd have been George Meade, I would have been extremely upset to read something like that because Abraham Lincoln, he was not there at the battlefield. He did not experience what these troops experienced, especially at Culp's Hill. And I do believe that Culp's Hill was the most violent day of that battle. The National Park Service, they don't pay enough attention about what happened at Culp's Hill. They talk about the first day's battle, which was a, a miserable route. Confederacy took that field that day. And we get to the second day's battle of Culp's Hill. That's went on and on and on all day long. The trees, they were defoliated from the mini balls. That battle picked up the next day on the third day. They couldn't quite win that. Then the next thing we know, we're at Longstreet. And he has to tell George Pickett. And Pickett's all fired up. He says, you are going to take that position to cops the trees. <coughs> and then they start across that field after that horrible two-hour cannonading on the third day's battle. It must have been horrendous walking across that. We have Union artillery on top of Little Round Top. They are sending all type of projectiles against this Army of Northern Virginia. And those men are walking a mile across that battlefield and they are being <coughs> annihilated. A few of those troops do make it up to the high water mark and it's just another carnage. On the retreat, on that retreat with the Northern Army of Northern Virginia, they did not go back Peacefully, they were fired upon. A lot of people, if you do enough research, you will read about this. The bodies, the men are laying there. They're trying to get back across the field, but they are still being fired upon. So here we are, it's 1864. We have George McClellan, which I have a great admiration for. <coughs> He's been relieved of command now two times. A lot of people uh, poke fun of him. I never will. I went to a military academy over in Tabersburg. The man believed keeping his troops well supplied, well, fed, well fed, and well armed. He did not want to go into battle unless he felt that way. He says, my men, I have to try to take care of them. But Lincoln wanted to get this battle over with. He said, we've got to get this horrible conflict to try to draw our nation back together. So he's relieved again two times. <clears throat> We're brought in Ulysses S. Grant. I don't know if I have admiration for him or not, but again, he was a commander of the Union Army. Mary Lincoln thought he was the butcher because of some of the horrible casualties. She said, he is a butcher. Look how these men are dying. And Lincoln said he's going to get this war over with. We have to try to get this over with. I'm trying to keep this short here. Some of the battles that we're dealing with here in 1864. Under the command of George Meade, we had the wilderness in Virginia. Why this is called the wilderness? Because when our early settlers came in, they could not plow this area. It was so thick with vines and trees. There was a few roads, the Orange Plank Road happened to go through there, but to try to farm it, you could not farm it. But yet, 
me, we waged war into that horrible night there. It was a horrendous battle, horrendous battle. In the evening, the woods caught fire. Now here we have hundreds of northern as well as Confederate troops. They're being consumed. They're burning in this horrible nightmare. We can't get them out. And the men heard them screaming as they're being burned to death. We have a battlefield, a big battle called Cold Harbor. This, this occurs in June. Grant is in charge of this. This whole month, every day, Grant is losing 2,000 men a day. 2,000 a day. A frontal, frontal assault during the very first day of Cold Harbor. Now listen to this for statistics. In one half hour, a half hour, we lose 7,000 Union men. Not in the day. <coughs> a half hour, 7,000 men lost their lives. That evening, Grant was found in his tent so upset he was crying. Grant would not eat any type of red meat unless it was thoroughly cooked. He hated the sight of blood. But yet, look what happened to our troops, to our troops there. Also that month, and we're going to go start going down south a little bit, we have the Siege of Atlanta. The Siege of Atlanta. You've all heard of Sherman and the March to the Sea. Well, we're trying to starve the civilians out of Atlanta. We have to take this as a pivotal point. Because most of these battles now have been up here in Virginia, Pennsylvania areas. So now we're down south. The south, they need to have brought in all types of provisions. We have these fabulous ships coming from England. They're called blockade runners. They're built for speed. They have all these masts on them. Some have side wheelers, boilers in them to try to get through the Union blockade. If you are a captain and you're bringing the provisions, you will make a lot of money if you are successful to get through the Union blockade. The South is dependent. They're trying to get the cotton sent to England because England needs our cotton. But the South, again, during this whole conflict, they have not been provisioned correctly. Union dead are stripped on the battles to try to get these men with arms and also with clothing. So who's in charge here of the Confederacy? Here in Atlanta, we got Joe Johnson. He's a tough fighter. He's real tough, and he's given Sherman a battle, a horrendous battle. So Sherman has said, he's told from Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, he says, you are going to march east towards the Atlantic and you are going to have a swath 100 miles wide you will burn everything in front of you and destroy everything and to this day when, I'm, when I travel and when, in my band I'm down south people still hate the name of Sherman and it's brought up to me and that's to this very day the march to the sea so Sherman is going with his troops and so they're heading towards the Atlantic they're annihilating they're burning pillaging destroying all provisions barns and then once he gets to the sea he starts northward. A lot of people don't know this. He starts northward, and he again, he's heading up to, to Washington, D.C. He is burning and burning and burning to try to bring the South to their knees. So this is where I'm going to stop right now, because next year we're going to go into a real nightmare. But this is what we're dealing with in 1864. And we have one of our generals again, George Meade, who I, not George Meade, McClellan, and he's going to run for office. The troops love McClellan. And he's going to go against Abraham Lincoln, and they're going to have their hands full. So this is going to be discussed here with Abraham Lincoln. I want to show you this particular projectile here, this, this horrible bayonet. This thing is cruel. This, this was designed to injure and hurt people. This is designed by the Austrians. 1853. It goes on a musket, which I have on the table, called an Austrian Lorenz. This is so insidious, this has four sides on it. When this hit a man, the doctors could not repair the wounds correctly. A regular bayonet has three sides. But this goes to show you, this is cruelty. Humanity, we designed this to kill one another. This cannot be repaired when you got, when you got yourself hit with one of these. But you're more than welcome to take a look at some of these artifacts we have over here. 
It's nice to try to talk and get it out. I didn't want to drag this out because I don't have David get mad at me again. But uh, I'm, I'm glad to be able to kind of give you a little bit of insight of what did occur here. 1864. Now I'm going to turn this over to our president, President Abraham Lincoln, everybody, please. One of the over 1,300 books written about the man. And when he spoke about Gettysburg, you can see how he aged and what he might have looked like. And this is a handwritten, he wrote this copy of the Gettysburg Address. And as he gave it, he didn't think it was going to accomplish what it needed to accomplish. Does anybody know who spoke before Mr. Lincoln talked? They got the best guy in the country to give speeches. Edward Everett. He only talked for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when they, after that, then they had a musical selection they had written for the dedication of the cemetery, and then the president stood up and talked. Well, there was no PA system, so how could these thousands of people possibly hear the president? He had a high tenor voice, and if everybody's quiet, that voice just carries really well, and a lot of people could hear him. Most people did. And as soon as he was done, he sat down, and he turned to somebody beside him and said, that speech won't do anything. He thought it was a total failure. And I think it was because they were just starting to listen. They thought, well, the president's done with his introduction. Now he'll say something. And they didn't realize he was finished. And they were just all in shock. They didn't know what to do. And so he sat down and nothing happened. So that, that's a little bit of what happened. Um, it was the first, first time Lincoln had been to Gettysburg. And it was one of the only in several times that he left the federal city because he didn't have time. The only time he went anywhere was to see generals or to review troops or something like that. So Gettysburg was, was one of the few trips that he made. And somebody realized that he was coming and so they got a special Pullman car for him and all along the way from Washington, he didn't go from Washington up to Gettysburg. He went from Washington because the rail lines up to Baltimore and then they got on the track and went to Gettysburg. All along the way, he picked up politicians because the speech was given in November of 63. The next November was going to be the election, and Lincoln was up for election. Mm -hmm. Up till August, September, October, November, that close to the election, everybody said there's no way Lincoln can be reelected. It's impossible. And then the North started to win battles, and everything started to turn around. And so by the time you get to two or three months before the election, everybody can see what's happening, and they see the, the, the country turning. And so they made sure that all the soldiers were going to be able to vote. Some states, they could do absentee ballots, they could do other things, but in the states where they couldn't, they released the soldiers up to a month to go home and vote and then come back. And the troops were very loyal to the president because when they would read his words and see his photographs, they realized that he was really on their side. He wanted the battle to be over. He wanted the victory to be won so it could be done with. And, and so they really loved the man, and almost all the soldiers voted for him. And th this one book has so many pictures in it. This is Mr. Lincoln when he started out, a very young-looking man. And yet, in four years later, this is what he looks like. With the lines, because he could hardly ever sleep. He didn't feel like eating because of the carnage. And you can see how he aged terribly. Plus the, the physical conditions that he had. We, we don't have a good diagnosis, but we have some ideas of what happened. He had something that, that would make him so melancholy, and, and that's just the way he was. So as we start the year, this is a really good photograph of the president and his youngest son. So when Willie, the older son, when they got to the White House, Willie was 10 and Tad was 8. So when Willie had had scarlet fever, that greatly weakened him. And when he got typhoid on top of that, he couldn't handle it. And they didn't know anything to do to help him. And so slowly, he just the fever would, would go sky high and then come back down. And they thought he was getting better, and it never got better. So when he died upstairs in the White House, Mary would never go in that room again. She was so upset she couldn't go to the funeral downstairs. 
and Abe had to, to literally take that all on himself. And he was in great grief also. So because of that, then Tad lost his brother, his playmate. And Mary wouldn't allow any of the other children that they had met in Sunday school and were always at the White House playing. She wouldn't allow any of them to come back because it gave her memories of her son that had died. So he was literally alone in the White House with his dad. And so they, they spent a lot of time together. And if you watch the movie uh, Lincoln, at one point he's in discussion uh, because they have to get this passed through the House to abolish slavery forever, the 13th Amendment. And there's a tap on the door, and he said, that's my signal. And he goes over and talks to Tad. Because no matter what was going on, Tad was first. And if he ne needed to talk to Tad, then that was above, that was a bigger priority than anything else. I like this book because it goes, here's the beginning of the year, and then the two pages every month, it tells you what was going on. And when you realize how much they accomplished and how much they worked on, Beside the Civil War, it's simply amazing. Have you ever heard of the Homestead Act? If you would go out in Missouri or some of the unsettled West, and you would stake your claim and live on the land and farm it, it became yours. You could get free land. You could have a place to live that was your own. You don't think that opened up the West? Oh, yes. They passed that during the four years. How about land-grant universities? Ever heard of them? Oh yeah, Ohio State, Michigan State, Penn State, that was passed during that four years. So they were, the, the country was growing. I just read, I said, oh, that's how it worked out. Right before the November election in 1864, Abraham signs a bill. Nevada becomes a state. Three more electoral votes. <laughs> See, it's all about politics. He, Abraham Lincoln was a master politician. Everybody thought they were going to control him. Everybody on the cabinet thought, I will, will guide the president. And he looked like a bumbling idiot. He talked like he was from Kentucky, because he was. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Mary. She'll tell you. His ears were too big. He didn't walk right. He didn't eat right. Nothing he did was right. She tried to change him all the time. In that uh, day and age, if, if you had some money, then the husband and wife had separate bedrooms. And so if he was able to sleep, thank goodness, you know, he'd have a peaceful room to go to. And why was it so, so necessary to get some rest? Because every, all the time, there were people there coming to ask the president for things. And he would say, let them in. I can give them very little, but I can listen to them. And Thursday was his day. That's my public bath. Because anybody in the country that would come and sit he would listen to them. He would talk with them. And so that's how he knew what was going on. Because he was connected with the people very closely. The, the more I read about this man, the more impressed I am. And because Ohio was such a key state and had so many people, it was very important. Does anybody know who the Secretary of the Treasury was during Lincoln's administration? Salmon Chase. He wanted to be president. The Ohio delegation wouldn't even vote for him. <laughs> so he didn't get the nomination. That's, that's a whole other story about the convention in Chicago to get the nomination. It was the second time the Republican Party had gathered to nominate somebody for the president. 1856, it was Fremont. So by 1860, the only way Abraham Lincoln could win was because the Democrats were split between the Southerners and the Northerners. The different Republicans nominated another candidate. And with all these different factions, the vote being split so many ways, Abraham Lincoln was able to win. And everybody said, but, but he's, he's from the outback. He, he doesn't, he's not even civilized. How can he possibly? And, and when you saw the man, just the way he walked, being this tall, you just said, Oh my gosh, in the papers they said, he's an ape. Because <laughs> that's what he looked like. Nobody else was six foot four. Nobody else was this thin. When he was shot, they cut off his shirt, and they could not believe how muscular he was. Because at age five, his father Tom had given him an axe, and he hardly ever put it down. So what's, it's true. He would cut down trees, he would split them, and they would make the rail fences so that the livestock wouldn't get away. 
and he was so strong from doing that that it, it was when he was shot at about 11 o'clock he didn't die till after 7 the next morning because he was so physically strong even though he hadn't slept very much he was not eating right and all the other things that happened so it was amazing who this man was and what he accomplished because all around were all these different factions. You need to do it my way. No, you need to do that. You need to release the slaves immediately. No, you can't do it. And they were all saying different things. And he had to balance all this. He could not let the three border states, Maryland, Missouri, couldn't let them go to the south. He had to keep them in. He couldn't let England and France recognize the south. He had to balance all this. And everything had to be, it was a very precarious thing. So when the, the cabinet even would meet and suggest things, he had to take it into consideration. And this is how he made decisions. He had learned when he became a lawyer, if this is the problem, then I will look at it. And he looked at it and thought about it and thought about it from all different sides and said, now how do we do this? What is the right thing to do here? And finally he would come to the conclusion. So when he said, I will issue an Emancipation Proclamation to free the slaves in the rebellious territories. Well, where else were there slaves? Hardly anywhere else. He had no authority in the South, so he could release them in the South. It, he was a master politician, and those decisions that he made were key. I could go through month by month to find out what's happening up to the election, but uh, it, it's just, when you, when you read about it and you see what went on, like, for instance, in February of 1864, here's a, a picture. Willie's dead, but here's Tad riding his pony. Because somebody gave them, there's, there's children in the White House. All oh, right, they need to have a pony, so somebody sent a pony. They should have a couple goats, so they sent some goats. Do you know what goats do? They need everything. All the flowers, all the gardens, they were everywhere. It's a wonder they didn't become dinner. <laughs> And another one, there was another month where, where Tad was talking to somebody. They had gone somewhere because, you know, Tad was younger. He needed somebody to go with him. And Tad said, you know, you, you have to pay this bill because I ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's just amazing, all the things that, that went on. August, th this fellow here says, there is no way you can be reelected, Mr. President. There's no way. There's no support. You're, you're not going to win. In the end, he was a landslide. Abraham Lincoln had 212 electoral votes, and I don't even know if McClellan got 30. He got three states, that's all. Everybody else went for Abraham because the North started to win, and the country realized this man was really taking us on the right course, and he really wanted to end it well. He wanted to bring the South back in. He wanted to give the Negroes the right to vote. He wanted to recognize them as people, and, and it just, you know, it, it all evolved, it all took time for it to come about, but as they worked on things, then you could see that there was the plan. So I thought this was interesting, October, right before the election. This is the, the head of the Supreme Court. He had administered the oath of office to Abraham Lincoln. He died. So there's an opening on the Supreme Court. So. Mr. Salmon Chase from Ohio kept resigning. Lincoln said, I won't accept your resignation. He resigned one too many times. Abraham accepted it. He said, but I think you need to be on the Supreme Court. He knew what to do. He knew how to handle things. The, the picture right beside that, have you ever heard of Sojourner Truth? She came to the White House. She was, it says right here, she was a, a, a famous lecturer and evangelist. I said, get out. That was so general truth. Huh? Yep. <laughs> that's not a picture of them together. That's superimposed on there. And, and there's just other, here's the picture of, of the man that, that took Tad somewhere and he said, I ain't, I ain't got no money. That was October. And, and the, they were released to go home and vote, like I said. So here's some of the things. I could go on and on for a half hour just about these three pictures on this page. But you realize that they changed running mates. They didn't have Hannibal Hamlin from Maine the second term. They chose Mr. Johnson from Tennessee. Why? Because they wanted to balance the ticket. And, and this is what 
some people thought of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Believe me, it wasn't favorable, what they said about him being this tall. Mm -hmm. And you can see how old he looks. When they were in the, the movie Lincoln, um, Grant and, and Lincoln were on a porch, and they had a, a conversation while the troops were riding by. And he said, Mr. President, you have aged 10 years in the last year. And that's the truth. So he looked like that near the end. He looks like an 80, 90-year-old man. He was only in his 50s. And he died in his 50s? He's 56. Mm. Yep. So November comes, and the election. Well, how is he going to hear about the election results? There's no CNN. There's no telephone. <laughs> there's no, so how is he going to find out? How would they get news? Telegraph. You went down to the telegraph office. Telegraph office. It was a dark, rainy, dreary, cold day, and and he just didn't know if he was going to win or not. And Mary was especially anxious. Any idea why, ladies? She had run up twenty-seven thousand dollars in debt. <coughs> if Abraham found out about it, her goose was cooked. <laughs> yeah. So she was really anxious for him to win. She was manic depressive with no medication. So when she was higher than a kite, she and her cousin would go to Philadelphia and New York and they knew how to spend money. The White House hadn't been touched for like 30 years, all those administrations. Everything was worn out. The carpet was totally worn out. The wallpaper was peeling off the walls. And she had waited for decades to become the first lady. And she got right to work. And they went to Philadelphia and said, I like that paper with gold in it from Paris. I think that's the paper we should have in the East Room. And she decorated. They said, oh my goodness, Mary, the place is transformed. The curtains, you know, the tassels that hang down from the curtains. And then you jump ahead to when he was killed. Didn't they have a key? Didn't they have locks on the doors? People came in and cut those off as souvenirs. They stole the china. They stole all the silver. I said, where was the guard? They had all those doors and they had one guy the doorkeeper. So I guess that's what happened. Anyway, the more you read about this, the more amazed <coughs> that you are. And I looked at this and I said, what? He changed hairstyles? <laughs> I don't ever remember him looking like that. <laughs> but mostly, I think he just, he just you know, tanned back and that's how he kept his hair. He brought Mr. Johnson from Illinois and he was like his butler, his bodyguard, and all the rest. And he got sick and he died. And Abraham paid for his tombstone. So the more you read, the more you see the heart of Lincoln. You get under, you understand who he was and what he really stood for. So if you'd like to see some more, I, I looked in my family albums last night and I found a picture of my great grandmother, Leona Summers. And I just had popcorn, and there it is. <coughs> Leona Isidore Summers. I said, if there's any more German name than that, I don't know what there is. <laughs> and she was born in 1862. Who was president in 1862? Abraham Lincoln. So maybe that's the link. But I figured out if I was the right height and I was thin and I wasn't real handsome and I loved to tell jokes, I could do Lincoln. <laughs> I was a music teacher. I learned to do a little bit of drama because I had to entertain the classes because I had to be as good as TV to keep their attention. <laughs> So I really enjoy doing this. And there's an example back there, what he would have for lunch. The cup, black coffee, toast, and maybe a hard-boiled egg. Everything simple. He was a very simple man. He grew up in times. It, they, were, they were fortunate to have anything at all. Mm -hmm. It was a very hard life. When they made one of the moves, his dad, it was, it was always in November, right when winter starting, and, and they called it a three-face camp. The whole side of, of their dwelling was open. It was one of the coldest winters on record. You tried to keep a fire going. Well, well, what's it like when you cook with wood? Everything turns black. You, the smoke, imagine what they smelled like. And, and they almost the whole winter, because Tom was so lazy, it took him forever to get around to building a cabin. And they, somehow they survived. And then one winter, when Abraham was nine, his mother drinks milk. The cows have been eating the snake root, root plant, and they didn't know. It was deadly. If you drank the milk after they'd eaten that 
weed, and you die. Within three days, your tongue swelled up, and you literally burned to death with a fever, and you died. His mother had taken care of an aunt and uncle. They both died, and then she got it, and she died. So here's Tom, the father, Sarah, the daughter, and Abraham, who's a couple years younger, and they're without, you know, his mother. There they are in the prairie with the three of them, and they're trying to survive. And so the daughter sort of is trying to do the mother's stuff, but, you know, she wasn't old enough to really do it. She's only 11. And after a few months, Tom gets an idea. He said, I dated her back in Kentucky. I think I need to go back to Kentucky. So the story goes, no video cameras. We don't really know what happened. He gets to the door, knocks on the door. She comes, Sarah Bush Johnson. And he explains, you know, I'm a widower. You're a widow. I think we should get married. She said, I got debt. Short and sweet, to the point. A day later, the debt's all paid off. Tom took care of it. All the things are in the wagon. And he takes them back up to Indiana. The stepmother gets there. Here's Abraham and his sister living alone. There were relatives nearby. They weren't really alone, but they were alone. And, and they were just filthy dirty from the smoke, from the fire. And she comes in, and, and the stepmother has feather beds. So the leaves they were sleeping on up in the loft, they're gone. She has furniture. She actually has cooking utensils. I mean, I mean it's just like the whole world opened up for Abraham. And right away, she saw his brilliance. And he wanted to learn to read better. And she actually had a Bible. So he could have a Bible in his house, and he could read it. And she helped him. And, and it changed his whole life. And she encouraged him to go to school. Tom was set against, why would you want to waste the time? I need the children to help me on the farm. Why would you want to waste the money and the time and have them go to school? And she said, they need to go to school. So they went to school. Abraham said when he ran for Congress or the Senate, altogether, I think I had one year of schooling total. One year. That's all. Everything else he taught himself. If you arrive in Washington, D.C., the only time he was in the military was the Black Hawk War. He said the only blood that was drawn in that war was the mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> it was so short. And, and all the men elected him the captain. He said that's the greatest, greatest honor I ever got. My fellow men elected me to be their leader. And that was done in a couple. They never had any skirmishes with the Indians. And so, um, you know, you, you just put all the pieces together. And, and you say, how much was Lincoln, was Mary instrumental in pushing Lincoln back into politics? Because he had failed, he had lost his house seat, and, and all this had happened and that had happened. How much was her pushing him forward? How much was it the two of them collaborating together? And, and you just try to piece things together with letters and conversations of people that knew them. And it's really hard to know the truth, because it happened so long ago. I have to tell you one more thing about his uh, stepmother. Before he left Springfield to go to Washington, he went one more time to visit her. And what was written in the book that I read was they probably both knew in their hearts they would never see each other again. His travel was so difficult, and his stepmother was, was very elderly. And when they, they parted, why she was crying, and she said, you know, I, I probably won't ever see you again. But when people asked him about his mother, he said, oh, it doesn't matter, my... my birth mother or my stepmother, they were both mother to me. So you get an idea of, of what shaped Lincoln, how he became who he was, and what made him tick. And, and somehow his learning to think and reason and to use his brain, because for 21 years he had almost been a slave to his father on the farm. And he said, I'll never have any money if I'm a farmer. And I'll never amount to anything, and I'll never accomplish anything. So I have to do something else. And he tried like four or five other things. Surveying. What other president was a surveyor? Washington. Washington. Yeah, George Washington. He tried clerking in the store. Made some bad decisions. Who was his partner? A man who was an alcoholic. What did they sell? Barrels of whiskey. <laughs> When that was over and the partner died, Abraham Lincoln was stuck with thousands of dollars in debt. He called it my national debt. 
only when he was a lawyer and started to get contracts from the railroad and the big companies was he able to pay that back. So when you, you look at this and you see how it all worked out, you start to understand who this man was. And there is no way that the right person would have come on the scene. Somebody was praying. God answered prayer and sent Abraham Lincoln. Because the four years before he was there was the only man that was ever elected from Pennsylvania. And when I read about him, and he was scared to death, he would offend somebody. So he did nothing for four years. He let the Civil War just come on like a, like a speeding freight train. And he told Lincoln on Inauguration Day, if you are as happy to enter this house as I am to leave this house and go home, you are the happiest man. And Lincoln knew from the time he was elected in early November until they didn't inaugurate till March the 4th. And that's when everything fell apart and they started to secede and they knew there was a confederacy. And, and he couldn't do anything because Buchanan was still president and, you know, you can't do anything. And, like, and all the way from him leaving Springfield to travel to Baltimore and then finally to Washington, there were death threats, there were plots. Pinkerton, ever heard of Pinkerton? That's the original Mr. Pinkerton. He was his bodyguard. And they heard about the plots, and they said, you cannot get on that train from Baltimore and go to Washington as you're scheduled, as you publish that you're going to go, because you will not make it alive. They will assassinate you. So they put the collar up, and they gave him a woman's hat, and he wrapped up so you could hardly see him at all. And the night before, they snuck him on the train, and he got to... So what did the paper say? He snuck into town. It's like, oh my God. No matter what you do, you can't win. <laughs> so if you have any questions, I'll be happy. Um, Take, take a look at, at the books. It's just fascinating that the pictures. I'm so glad that there was photography before that happened. But, but once again, you see the stark difference between the young president and four years later what's happened to him. And you say, how did he do it? How did he make it? How did he survive? And somehow, he got through it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, by the way, this is Jim Krauss from uh, Pittsburgh, and this other guy from Salem with John and Gilbert. We appreciate their continued series. Next year will be the conclusion of the four-year series, so thank you very much for coming. And uh, there's other things to do yet today. We're here until 3 o'clock. At least 20 minutes you got to do something else. So thanks for coming.